Uh, greetings, everyone. This is Peg Brady and NOAA Fisheries here in Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, and welcome to our EBM, EBFM, Ecosystem Based Fishery Management uh, Seminar Series, which is held on the second Wednesday of each month. And uh, we have our speaker today, Kristen Marshall, joining us from her laboratory in Seattle uh, at the Northwest Fishery Science Center. Uh, but I would like to take a moment just to remind folks uh, about, and this is the slide that you see online right now, it's NOAA Fisheries Update on the Ecosystem-Based Fishery Management Plan. Um, and just if you could turn to the next one. Uh, if you recall, uh, for folks who may not be familiar with this, uh, NOAA Fisheries adopted a policy and a roadmap back in 2016 with an effort to advance regional ecosystem science planning and assessments. Uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work uh, since that uh, roadmap was adopted. And I just want to share with folks that there is a uh, set of draft EBM implementation plans that have been developed by our regional staff uh, throughout the country and here at headquarters. And all those draft plans are available at that website that you can see right now on the screen. I want to remind folks that we have, they've been available um, for the last couple of months online, and they folks have up until uh, September 30th to submit uh, their comments to these plans. Um, and if you go to that website, it'll tell you exactly how to do it. You can do it region by region and also by headquarters. Um, and then a little bit about the schedule. Uh, as I say, uh, the deadline for review and comment is September 30. Um, and then uh, the staff in the uh, regional offices and science centers as well as here in headquarters uh, will work to uh, revise those plans and update those plans and our tentative date for uh, releasing that is in the month of December for final regional implementation plans. These will be five-year plans uh, with an eye towards how uh, the agency, NOAA Fisheries, will operationalize ecosystem-based fishery management. And I just want to take a moment to share that information with everyone before Kristen uh, begins her presentation. Each of these presentations uh, give folks an insight into the work that's being done uh, within our regional uh, uh, offices and science centers throughout the country and give you a sense of the kind of work that's being done to support ecosystem-based fishery management. And I want to thank Kristen uh, Marshall, who is speaking with us today. She's the Management Strategy Evaluation Coordinator for the Northwest Fishery Science Center. And uh, I will turn it over to Kristen, who is uh, in her office in Seattle. Uh, there is an opportunity to ask questions. We'd like you to do that at the close, or you can post them online. Um, and our uh, colleagues here in the NOAA Fisheries Library, uh, Katie Rowley, will uh, review those questions and we'll take them up uh, when Kristen completes her presentation. Again, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this has been a great opportunity to for many folks across the country and beyond to learn a lot more about uh, NOAA Fisheries and the work we're doing here. So thanks again. And Kristen, you, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Sounds good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. And the screen looks okay. Yes, it does. Thank you, Kristen. Great. Um, thanks so much, Peg. Uh, and uh, as Peg mentioned, I am the Northwest Fishery Science Center's uh, MSE coordinator. Um, really pleased to be with you all today. Thanks, everybody, for uh, dialing in online and uh, being there in the room in D.C., if there is anyone there in the room. Um, I, I'm excited to share with you some work that I've been involved with um, using management strategy evaluation uh, for ecosystem-based fisheries management. And, and particularly today, I'm going to focus on uh, thinking about objectives and trade-offs. Uh, and uh, using transdisciplinary research approaches. And so, let's see, oh, uh, outline for my talk today. Um, I'll, I'll just start with a little bit of background about um, how I view EBFM and MSEs and um, transdisciplinary research. So, introduce all that terminology, make sure uh, we're all on the same page, and then go into a couple of case studies. Uh, one, um, a Pacific herring and Haida Gwaii, and the second being uh, the Pacific Hake MSE process and the models we're building to inform that process. Um, 
that's very much an ongoing uh, ongoing work. So this is kind of a making of the sausage type talk, but hopefully will be uh, useful and informative to those of you that might be uh, interested in um, doing this kind of work or implementing these types of processes in your region. And then I'll just close with some uh, overall lessons learned so far. Um, so uh, I view ecosystem-based fisheries management as really uh, just uh, sort of a broader lens for seeking a triple bottom line sustainability. Uh, and so I like this uh, triple bottom line uh, terminology. It came originally from the business literature um, in the late 90s that uh, sort of framed sustainability as a way to balance uh, people, the planet, and profit. And so I think translating that from the, the its original inception to sort of the things that that we might be thinking about trying to balance with fisheries management um, are sort of thinking about social, ecological, and economic endpoints, and um, sustainability being the sort of balance between those uh, between those three. And so obviously there's a lot of room uh, in each of these domains to sort of uh, get clear definition and um, the sort of what it happens in any particular application uh, and the degree of uh, 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 sort of fineness of scale in each one of these domains will depend on the context of a particular case. Um, but I think, you know, in, in thinking about uh, how we define what is sustainable, uh, I think it begs the question sort of from whose perception are we considering sustainability? And so typically, um, you know, we think about harvested fish populations and sustainable harvest as it's defined in the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And so that's typically in terms of um, maximum sustained yield um, and sort of what's the maximum uh, way, uh, maximum sustained yield as uh, sort of reduced by uh, any of these other potentially important considerations. Um, so other things you might think about obviously are um, what's sustainable for uh, commercial fishers and fishing businesses in the fishing industry. Um, and that may or may not be the same thing as what's considered sustainable to uh, subsistence users or recreational users. Um, and then, you know, we also are often considering uh, what are the sort of broader implications in an ecosystem of the types of fisheries harvest. Um, and so I think obviously these are ultimately value-based choices and, and finding what is that sweet spot um, of, uh, of sustainability in a fisheries context. Uh, and from a science perspective, I think that we have a lot of tools in transdisciplinary science that can sort of uh, better quantify and um, outline the trade-offs among some of these different aspects of sustainability and try to make those more transparent. So ultimately the managers have the best information available to them uh, to, to make these difficult value-based decisions. So uh, that's sort of a transition point into uh, just transdisciplinary research and, and um, how I think this plays into some of these, uh, tackling some of these difficult problems around uh, defining sustainability in an EBSM context. And so there's decades of social science research that um, has gone into uh, developing best practices and figuring out what works and doesn't work and trying to integrate um, uh, or trying to use science to inform um, management and policy decisions. Uh, and so one of the frameworks that's kind of come out of this social science uh, work is this transdisciplinary research process. So this diagram I'm showing you here is a figure um, from a relatively recent paper that was focusing on implementing a transdisciplinary research process, process for ocean acidification, uh, but it's adapted from some of some uh, previous frameworks coming out of social science literature. And so the key things here to, to that I want you to take away is that uh, you know, in tackling some of these difficult environmental problems, um, we're bringing sort of the best science we have to bear at the, in these in these situations. But um, we can do this by we can probably do this better by in, integrating the uh, the science and the stakeholders uh, and managers into a research process where everyone is part of a team that's uh, uh, involved in both sort of scoping the problem as well as uh, co-creating the uh, knowledge and the solutions that will then later be used to uh, you know, actually be applied. And so in thinking about doing research in this context, um, it's, it's really a, about bringing in um, 
different kinds of information and knowledge from different kinds of people at all of these stages and, uh, and trying to do that in a, in a more integrated way. So um, what does that all mean for management strategy evaluation? Well, um, first I'll just uh, walk through what a management strategy evaluation is as a, as a research tool. Um, for anyone that's not intimately familiar with it, it it's typically follows a process that looks like these blue bubbles on the right hand side. Um, so you start by, uh, by specifying your objectives and performance metrics, the performance metrics being the ways you quantify your objectives. Um, then you develop the different management strategies or management options that um, you'd want to test. You then um, evaluate the, each of one of those options uh, and use that evaluation against the specified objectives um, to inform the choice of which one you would implement. And so this is really a structured decision-making approach um, to uh, choosing, um, choosing a management strategy. And so why would you want to go through a process like this? Um, well, there's uh, a number of reasons. Um, so the analogy, one analogy here is that you can think of MSE uh, as a sort of quality assurance or quality control for um, fisheries management in this context. Um, or you could also think about it as a way to sort of crash test your uh, potential uh, management options before you would go ahead and implement something new in the same way that your know, cars are crash tested before you let them out on the road. Um, so it allows you to sort of develop and screen alternative management strategies in a model world before you would actually implement them in the real world. And by doing this, hopefully it, in following the structured process, you can uh, improve decision making by uh, eliminating strategies that don't meet the objectives and ruling those out from further consideration. Um, and you can also just test the robustness of the current management strategy as sort of the status quo situation um, to things that might be changing in uh, the physical environment or different uh, assumptions about how um, the uh, your fish population, the ecosystem, or the fish and fleet dynamics, for example, might be functioning. And um, so ultimately what this allows you to do is look at uh, trade-offs among different management strategies um, before making a decision about which one to implement. Uh, and I think that uh, nowhere in this list, just want to point out, nowhere in this list does management strategy evaluations give you the best possible answer for which, you know, or, or give managers the best possible answer for what should they should do. It's really uh, a decision support tool to allow them to weigh the different options and then uh, eliminate the, the obviously bad ones. And then hopefully that helps them make a better decision about um, which one of the remaining choices might be good. So um, I also just uh, want to make the point here that management strategy evaluation typically informs strategic planning. Uh, and so in light of uh, a strategic planning cycle is uh, much longer than sort of the tactical management cycles that we think about with typical uh, to sort of year-to-year -year, um, catch level setting or stock assessment, uh, you know, uh, stock assessments that are run. Strategic planning is more about sort of guiding the overall ship. Sort of what uh, what's the harvest control rule we might want to use to um, manage this population, or um, how would changes to spatial management affect uh, the our ability to meet our management objectives? So it's sort of these larger scale, um, longer term questions that MSC is typically used to inform. So um, with that, hopefully I've given you a little bit of a flavor of um, some of the, the language I'm gonna be using and uh, how I'm gonna be uh, talking about these different case studies. And I'll jump right into this first one, uh, which is about eliciting pre preferences in participatory workshops um, using Herring and Heidegwai. And so this uh, work up in Haida Gwaii is uh, part of a larger project, uh, the Ocean Tipping Points project um, that I was fortunate enough to be involved with um, began before I started my job at NOAA. So, um, uh, but this is part of a larger, a larger project that is seeking to uh, better define, detect, characterize tipping points in marine ecosystems and provide managers with uh, tools to, for dealing with those tipping points. And when I say tipping points, I mean um, uh, sort of regime shifts or nonlinearities in both the uh, ecological system as well as the social systems around uh, that rely on, on uh, ocean ecosystems. 
And so this work uh, that I'm gonna talk about is not a management strategy evaluation, but it, it uses a lot of tools and approaches that I think are really relevant to the ideas about um, how we can uh, better define and set objectives and think about trade-offs in this sort of three-dimensional domain of social, ecological, and um, economic um, uh, outcomes. Uh, so the, the work is uh, strongly informed by previous uh, postdoc work of Adrian Steyer, uh, but the sort of core group here uh, that's been involved in this is uh, myself, uh, Melissa Poe, who's an anthropologist at the Northwest History Science Center, um, Phil Levin, who's now at the Nature Conservancy Washington, Carrie Capel down at UCSB, and uh, Jamil uh, Sampuri's uh, colleague at the Northwest History Science Center. I, uh, and I'll also mention that um, this work is, was, has been done in partnership with colleagues at the um, uh, Guayanas National Park uh, up in Haida Gwaii, as well as um, uh, the Council of the Haida Nation. And so uh, this case study focuses around herring, which are a small schooling forage fish, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, this is a, a photo of some specific herring schooling. And um, the ecosystem that we're talking about here is the Haida Gwaii Archipelago, which is north of uh, northern Vancouver Island, sorry, uh, north of Vancouver Island up in uh, British Columbia. Um, and so uh, herring here are uh, really critical components of both the social and ecological uh, systems. And uh, they support, um, uh, they're a really important cultural food resource for the Haida people, or the indigenous people of Haida Gwaii. Um, so herring spawn in the spring and lay their eggs uh, on kelp, among other things. And so this is a blade of kelp with herring spawn going uh, all stuck along it. Um, and this uh, spawn on kelp is uh, called gao in uh, Haida and is uh, an important year-round food source, even though it's ephemeral and in the nature of when it's uh, created. Um, so this is here, some photos of uh, spawn on kelp um, in, uh, being collected. So that big, that's a big blade of kelp that's just covered on both sides with um, herring eggs that's being pulled out of the water. And the photo on the right is a image of, of uh, gao being dried on lines in front of people's houses. And so, as I just mentioned, um, it's harvested in the spring, but then can be dried and preserved for uh, consumption year round. Um, and traditionally um, has been a, a, a really um, uh, important uh, food source for the Haida people. The uh, image in the middle there shows some spawn on kelp ponds. So there's another way to harvest gal is um, some uh, building some pond structures, uh, basically net pens around um, uh, with, with kelp inside them. So when the herring come into spawn, you can close the net, keep them inside until the spawning is complete and then let them go. Um, and then I will return to some of these fishing methodologies in just a minute. Um, so in addition to being uh, really important culturally, of course, herring uh, supports a lot of uh, upper trophic level uh, predators like whales and salmon and even some terrestrial predators like black bears. Um, and it also supports commercial fisheries in uh, British Columbia. And so this is a, a herring vessel that uh, you can see the uh, seine behind it that's uh, scooping up a big uh, school of herring. And so uh, and just by that introductory material, you can sort of already begin to imagine what some of the trade-offs might be here between um, thinking about the uh, uh, cultural uses of, of herring, commercial uses, um, and the uh, ecological uh, supporting role of the species. Unfortunately, um, herring in this region of the world has uh, gone through a number of collapses, the most recent one in the mid-90s um, that uh, has been very slow to recover and has resulted in quite a bit of conflict, particularly between the uh, indigenous peoples and the and DFO, the um, Canadian uh, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And so uh, in uh, 2015, when it looked like this population was finally starting to recover, the uh, DFO made a push to reopen the commercial herring fisheries, and this resulted in uh, some pretty major protests by First Nation members, uh, they actually occupied DFO offices to protest that this, this uh, fishery opener. Um, and that was because um, 
the, their perception was that these fisheries had not recovered, particularly not in the um, sites that were uh, their traditional harvest sites. And so uh, this is partly due to some underlying metapopulation dynamics that um, uh, I, th I think are pretty interesting and start to start lead to some spatial trade-offs. So here's a, a plot from Dan Okamoto, who did some work uh, in central BC uh, looking at herring population dynamics, but uh, so it's similar up in Haida Gwaii, where on the right you can see the trajectories of a bunch of different substocks of herring um, going up and down through time. Um, and then in the thick blue line shows you sort of what the overall stock trend is doing. And so uh, you can see there's quite a, there's quite a bit of uh, dynamic or there's a lot of variability in individual substocks, whereas the overall stock trend um, can look relatively stable. So uh, the scale of which of these subpopulations the, you might live next to or rely on for your harvest of herring um, is going to strongly depend on sort of your perception of the stock in that location and your ability to access um, that, that resource for, um, for food harvest. Um, and so um, ultimately with this particular work, what we were trying to do was um, better quantify and incorporate um, social benefits into performance indicators um, to um, help put those sort of on the same scale as some of the other outcomes that we typically look at um, in an approach like a management strategy evaluation. So this plot is just an example from one of Beth Fulton's papers um, looking at uh, sort of how she looked at different um, uh, management strategies in uh, an Australian case study. But uh, the point here that I want to highlight is that in each one of these management strategies, each one of these kite diagrams, there's sort of five different domains of um, outcomes, one of those being social. And so uh, what, what we're, we're trying to do in this case study is identify what exactly goes into that endpoint and how can we sort of um, better quantify and, and link it up with some of the other social, or some of the ecological and economic out, outcomes that uh, might be sort of more familiar. And so we did this, uh, sort of tried to find the social, the social outcomes in three different aspects, uh, thinking about food customs, um, thinking about connections with the ocean environment, and thinking about a living kind of culture. And these were, are sort of uh, put forth um, in some of the um, Haida management, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, planning documents as well as informed by uh, uh, some interview-based work that Melissa Poe uh, conducted as part of this study. And so what we were trying to do here was uh, basically look at different um, types of fishing scenarios and their uh, implications for both the uh, marine ecosystem under the water, the, what the food web looks like, as well as on land and what the social benefits resulting from these different types of fishing activities are. So we used an, a food web model, Ecopathic Ecosim, um, to, as an operating model or a simulation model to, to look at the implications of different kinds of fishing um, for uh, various food web components. And then we translated those outputs into graphics like these that um, sort of uh, provide a way to translate numbers into uh, uh, visualizations that we hoped uh, uh, non-scientists would be more likely to um, identify with. Um, and so uh, we looked at three different types of fishing scenarios. Um, one was based on traditional fishing only. Um, and so because this is a, a fishery for the, just the herring eggs, there's very little mortality um, to the adults, so pretty low fishing mortality. And the second one was um, commercial uh, spawn on kelp ponds. So those uh, ponds I mentioned in the early part of, the, part of my intro, which is thinking about um, including both egg mortality and a little bit of adult mortality versus a commercial reduction fishery or commercial sane fishery, which is, um, has higher adult mortality. However, um, I will mention while that mortality is different in each of these scenarios, it's not very different in that we, we wanted to emphasize um, the difference in social outcomes in, in these scenarios rather than um, trying to disentangle those from um, really big changes uh, in the marine food web as well. So uh, we ran these different fishing scenarios and then translated those uh, into uh, performance indicators that we then asked the people to react to. And so we presented those, these performance indicators in two ways. Uh, one was the, the diagram I just showed, it's like caricature, or sort of uh, 
visualizations of uh, the food web, and then also these pie charts that sort of represent key players in the ecosystem and how they might change. So these are just two different examples of two different locations um, where uh, there were different fishing activities going on. And so um, the economic endpoint here is just in terms of yield. So the, the yellow bar shows you if there's uh, uh, biomass being removed by that commercial reduction fishery or not. Um, and then on the social side, we link this up with uh, performance indicators uh, through work that Melissa Poe led um, that was influenced by uh, interviews that she did with Haida community members, as well as some workshops that were part of um, a separate project, the Ocean Modeling Forum project that focused on herring as well. Um, and so uh, don't look too hard at the um, details of this table. What I really want you to take away is that um, there's a range of social benefits that are coming from different kinds of fishing, um, and they're largely linked to um, how much herring biomass is present. Uh, and so, and we quantified these, or Melissa uh, sort of characterized these in uh, three different ways. So both the, the different ways of the sort of co big columns across the top, the ability to practice the harvest, access to herring and spawn and kelp as food, and then uh, community and social relationships. And so we line these social benefits up with the fishing scenarios and the uh, 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 food web implications of those um, to make one graphic like this for each fishing scenario that we explored. So now you can see the marine food web underneath as, as I showed you before, but now there's uh, the social benefits that are being depicted on land of various fishing activities. So this was a, an example that had all, all the fishing activities simultaneously, so um, has, has all of the potential social benefits on land. There's people on the beach that are um, gathering uh, rowan kelp. There's rowan kelp being dried along, on lines in front of houses, and there's feasts that are happening um, in the community halls and different village sites. And so these are the, sort of the way that we characterize the benefits from these fisheries and the um, different uh, images that represent different scenarios then have uh, the presence or absence of those social benefits depending on the type of fishing that's present. So what we ultimately did was to ask uh, participants in a series of workshops to score their preferences for the depicted scenarios um, and then uh, supported those with um, questionnaires where um, we asked about uh, things like well, basic demographic questions and then also um, uh, the experience of practicing the harvest, the frequency of, of consuming rowan kelp, and the frequency of visitation to Guayhanes, uh, the which is the national park that's uh, south of the um, uh, sort of village site, but uh, or the, there's the currently occupied village site, but uh, requires a boat to get to. So there might be more herring present down there, and and, and um, the Haida can um, harvest closer down in that region, but uh, you can't just walk there from your house or use a very small boat to get there. Uh, and so uh, we had had four or five workshops up in Haida Gwaii, um, and they got a range of men and women, ranging in, yet from 19 to 86. Um, about half of them were either born on Haida Gwaii or been li had lived there for more than 25 years, and um, half uh, were more recent uh, transplants. And so now I'm gonna show you some results from these workshops, and. Um, of how we began to understand them. So here are some scored preferences for the different fishing scenarios that we presented people with. So these are just three different scenarios. Um, traditional fishing only on the bottom, commercial pond fishing in the middle, commercial sand fishing on top. And what we saw um, from the scores were that participants in these workshops overall um, preferred the commercial pond fishing scenarios over traditional fishing only and preferred traditional fishing only over commercial sane fishing. Uh, and this was somewhat surprising because I think we thought going in that the traditional uh, fishing only scenario would be the most uh, preferred. But what, as it turned out that this was perceived by the, the workshop participants as a um, as the status quo scenario of right now, there isn't actually enough um, herring uh, row and kelp to go around, uh, fauna and kelp to go around. And so ultimately uh, the, their responses reflect the idea that commercial pond fisheries might increase the amount uh, of, of those resources in the communities. And this is reflected 
um, differentially among men and women, which was really interesting, and among um, long-term residents and short-term residents. So uh, women and long-term residents uh, had had were uh, wanting more hearing than is currently available in particular. And this is reflected in sort of their scores for how often they were uh, consuming swan on kelp versus how much they would like to be consuming it. Um, so uh, reflecting that there's some differential effects within these communities of uh, the different kinds of fishing practices and the current status quo situation. Um, we also saw this reflected in um, terms of how uh, residents respond or the per workshop participants responded to um, the questions about how often they visit Guayana, um, this, uh, uh, this site that's uh, somewhat, uh, you know, or requires a larger boat to access. Um, and we saw that uh, the long-term resident women were sort of the least uh, likely to be visiting Guayanas, uh, reporting mostly rarely or never being there. Um, and so this, both of these responses sort of start to reveal uh, some differences within um, these populations of, of uh, partic workshop participants and um, has some consequences for how we think about uh, some objective and objectives and consequences of uh, different types of fishing activities. So to just sort of sum up what we're learning, what we've learned in this particular case study, uh, the commercial seine fishing was generally undesirable, and that wasn't because of the uh, ecological outcomes um, that were depicted in the scenarios, because they weren't that different than the others. It was largely because um, the social benefits weren't the same. Um, the spawn on kelp ponds were most preferred because uh, the uh, because the status quo situation of traditional fishing only is is not currently uh, doesn't appear, appear to be meeting the food needs of everyone in the community, and particularly that seems to be true for um, the uh, native and long-term resident women, the people that were born in Haida Gwaii, have lived there for a long time. So I think this reflects some uh, potentially an important social tipping point that has occurred here, in that um, uh, this the practice of harvesting. Uh, spawn on kelp used to be uh, primarily something that was done by women and children and elders in small boats or from shore. And now, uh, because of the changes in that population, the access has changed. Um, and so I think the approaches that we used here um, sort of are, are, are useful in helping us um, think about uh, some of the social outcomes and quantifying those and linking them up to um, the uh, some of the more typical ecological and economic outcomes that we might typically think about um, in a study like this. So I think it's a good example of uh, sort of this transdisciplinary research approach uh, and bringing different kinds of knowledge and tools um, to the table to um, tackle some of these questions. So um, with that, I'm going to move into uh, the Pacific Lake MSE um, that has been occupying a lot of my attention over the last uh, year and uh, bring some of the, these same ideas um, into that uh, fishery and process. Um, and while when I started, I thought it would be quite different, um, what I've begun to see is that there's a lot of uh, parallel uh, issues that sort of, I think, probably come out of any sort of, uh, any, any process like this, where you're considering um, all of these domains, ecological, social, and um, economic, and, um, and how, uh, different fishing practices might influence those. So uh, for the Pacific Hake MSC, this is something that um, I am working on with uh, a postdoc at the Northwest Fishery Science Center in Ms. Jacobson and uh, Ian Taylor and Aaron Berger, who are both stock assessment scientists um, and uh, have been involved with the uh, Pacific Hake stock assessment for the past several years. And we're focusing on testing the robustness of the Pacific Hake management system to Migration, climate change, or climate variability, and directional change. Um, and so, um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Pacific Hake, um, uh, this is actually not a Pacific Hake, but I, just, I couldn't resist it because it was a fish pie. Uh, so uh, this is a fish pie representing all of the uh, landings on the U.S. West Coast in a given year. About uh, two thirds of that is by biomass is made up of uh, Pacific Hake or whiting, as they're known. Um, so it's a really uh, high biomass important fishery on the west coast of the U.S. Um, it's managed by a, an international treaty between the U.S. and Canada um, that is, allocates 
um, 74% of the catch every year to the U.S. and 26% to Canada, uh, and um, specifies a harvest control rule, uh, it's a 40-10, sort of a typical 40-10 harvest control rule um, as the sort of default uh, default way to set catch limits. And the fishery is um, is heterogeneous uh, both in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, and so, uh, on the U.S. side, the a lot of the big vessels that catch hake, the motherships um, that they have uh, at sea catcher vessels that deliver to them, and there's also large catcher processor vessels. Um, those these vessels are the same as the uh, same vessels and the same companies that are fishing pollock up in Alaska. Uh, so they kind of zoom down to catch hake um, uh, when they're not fishing pollock. And uh, and then in addition to that, there's also shore-based uh, vessels that deliver to processing plants, and there's a tribal um, sector as well. Uh, on the Canadian side, there's uh, freezer trawler vessels, which are similar to the uh, similar to catcher processors, but not as big. Um, and and then shore-based vessels, like on, like on the U.S. side, that are delivering to processing plants. And so already, when you think about um, this is just a commercial fleet, uh, we, we, we can see that there's set up for some potentially uh, different trade-offs and objectives and how, we, how different components of this fishery might be thinking about um, you know, what are the best options for, for uh, managing the fish and, and sort of what the implications of shifts in management might be for different components of the, of the fishery. Uh, and so Pacific hake migrate up and down the U.S. West Coast uh, every year. Um, the conventional wisdom is that they all go south to spawn, although that's kind of coming into question um, now. Um, and so, but, but uh, conventionally it's been thought that they spawn in the south in the winter and come north uh, to, uh, in the summer to the fishing grounds. Um, the bigger fish typically move further north. And so this results in... Um, more fish and younger fish in the U.S. than Canada in uh, the summer months of the fishery. And this is, these data that I'm showing you here are just the average age, uh, sorry, that um, surveyed by biomass on the left, and uh, the survey biomass on the left, and the average age of the survey on the right, looking at uh, uh, the differences between the U.S. and Canada. And so given that this uh, fish population is moving around and given that there's this uh, highly dynamic fishery that's occurring, um, uh, it's a good candidate for a management strategy evaluation process, both in, think both in thinking about how the current management is uh, functioning now and um, how it might, uh, how that, uh, how it might be, how it might meet objectives in the future under changes in environmental conditions, for example, uh, with climate change. And so this is the MSE process that um, we're establishing for Pacific Hake. So this is not the first time that, uh, MSC, that an MSE has been done for Hake. Um, there was previous work in uh, 2013, 2014, around then, um, looking at the performance of the existing harvest control rule. Uh, but now we're investigating that performance in the context of the spatially variable population. Uh, so in, including um, some uh, spatially explicit dynamics in the Hake, Hake model. And so uh, here I just want to emphasize that this is uh, this diagram is really similar to the sort of four-step uh, diagram I showed you at the beginning when I was introducing management strategy evaluation. Only here now I'm uh, emphasizing the sort of plan the MSE, plan and design pieces of the MSE even more. Um, and I think that has been really important for getting everybody on the same page uh, and what we're um, trying to accomplish in this uh, in this research process and, and trying to view this in a transdisciplinary way. So um, we have uh, co-created goals for the Hake MSC along with the um, management bodies for uh, for Hake. And uh, the way that we've stated this, the goals you can see on the screen. So the first is to evaluate the status quo management for, under different hypotheses about current and future environmental conditions. The second is to better understand the effects of the Hake distribution um, and its movement up and down the West Coast on both countries' ability to catch their fish. And the third is to better understand how fishing in each country affects the availability of fish to the other country in future years. 
And so um, those are sort of to kind of bound the scope of the problem we're trying to tackle. Um, uh, sort of second big step after establishing those goals was to um, form or reform this management strategy evaluation working group. And so I believe this existed in the past, but um, it sort of has new uh, uh, new operating rules um, than, than it did before. So here are the sort of four main players or the four management bodies that are involved with take management. There's the joint management committee, which are the people that are making the decisions. The uh, advisory panel includes um, industry representatives and fishermen. Um, there's the joint technical committee that includes the stock assessment scientists and then the scientific review group, which is reviewing um, those assessments as well as the MSC. Uh, and each of these groups, because this is an internationally managed uh, stock, has uh, representatives from both the US and Canada. So what we've done is to form this management strategy evaluation working group. Um, so the management bodies themselves meet uh, about twice a year and um, to really get going um, with the MSE and make a lot of progress in, in the near term, we need to have sort of more frequent meetings and contact. And so we established this working group to do that, uh, that has representatives from both the management committee as well as the advisory panel, um, our MSE analyst team, um, and uh, uh, which includes several of the, of the joint technical committee members, um, and also sort of keeps in regular touch with them, with the rest of them. Um, so we have this working group, and then um, we also, of course, are reporting out in a more formal way to the uh, management committee and the scientific review group. Um, and, it's, and it's taken a little bit of thought and iteration to sort of get this process um, working in a way that uh, that um, everyone is happy with. And so I just I think it's worth mentioning and thinking about um, how you might have set something like this up, who's going to be involved in each of the stages, and how frequently uh, you're going to be communicating. Uh, and so in this sort of MSE plan and design stage, we've uh, set up a work plan and a two-year timeline to achieve that work plan that uh, sort of outlines the specific uh, things that we're going to do and how, what the models are, are um, what, how, how and when the models are going to be developed. Um, and then we have sort of focused on some sort of key decisions uh, or sort of conversations that we've had with, uh, in the, within the MSC working group um, to discuss things like the objectives and performance metrics that we're going to use, uh, the operating model, uh, the, what's the simulation model going to look like that we're going to develop, and then some different, you know, well, how are we going to explore some uncertainties, and the management strategies. So I just want to highlight the objectives piece and, and how we're going about that um, here. And then um, just I'll mention one of the others, and then I'll go into the model itself. So in thinking about objectives and performance metrics and MSC context, um, you know, the best ones are really specific, measurable, and time-bound. So we want them to be um, things that we can easily calculate from our simulation models, but are also meaningful for the uh, managers, managers and stakeholders. Um, and so we are building these from a management principles document that the Joint Management Committee came up with a few years ago, as well as the information that's uh, defined in the Pacific Cake Treaty and uh, was used in the prior management strategy evaluation done here. So the first one of these uh, goals of uh, the managers is to manage the Pacific Cake resource in a precautionary and sustainable manner. Um, there's some sub goals under this that, that we have uh, sort of are, are iterating on. And so I'll just go through what those, kind of, what those look like. So um, the first one is that this is really about uh, minimizing the risk of stock collapse. Uh, so and, and with, you can see that the objectives here will kind of line up with the control points in the harvest control rule. So you want to maintain the population above 10% uh, of unfished biomass in most years. And so we, then we have to specify how, you know, how, what percent of years do we want the population to be above that. Um, and and so, so they landed on 95%. Uh, and the second one here is, uh, you know, minimizing the risk of a stock dropping below a threshold that impairs recruitment. Um, uh, and so that we sort of defined as, as you know, how often do you want to be above the 40% of unfished biomass threshold. Uh, and so they sort of, they defined that. Uh, and then there was a third one, um, just to illustrate that this is, this process is really iterative. Um, 
there was uh, one of the managers brought up that the they were more concerned that if the stock dropped below the threshold, one of these thresholds, it wasn't that if it dropped below well, for one year that it was problematic. It was if it dropped below a threshold and then stayed there for multiple years. And so we tried to formulate an objective around that. Um, that ultimately, after uh, multiple iterations of conversations, has been has since been dropped. Uh, and so I just bring that up again to mention the iterative nature of, of going about uh, these objective setting exercises. The second goal is to ensure that both parties receive their intended benefits under the treaty. So this is really about um, can each of the countries catch the fish that they've been allocated. Um, and so we have some spatially explicit objectives here that um, are about whether uh, both Canada and, and US can um, uh, have enough vulnerable biomass in, within their, the area that they can fish uh, that they can actually um, catch what's been allocated to them uh, in most years. And so that there's one of these that's specified for Canada and one for the US. And then um, there's also sort of some concern about a, uh, about uh, total allowable catches that being set below 180,000 metric tons. Um, and so we included an objective here that uh, we, they, they wanted the tech to be above that uh, or, or yeah, be above that in most years. Okay, so then um, we also have some objectives that are specifically about um, maximizing catch in the short term as well as in the long term. Um, and so uh, the idea being here that there's some trade-offs in term catch and sustainability and long-term catch and sustainability in previous uh, MSC simulations for a lot of different species. So that's something they wanted to explore. And then um, the last one is thinking about variability in catch. Um, and so um, there's often uh, a, a trade-off between the year-to-year -year variability in catches. If they're um, really, if you allow them to be really variable, then um, that 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 is maybe good for some components of the fishery, but not others. Um, or sort of some businesses are more able to uh, to deal with large scale variability, while others are not. Um, and so this is one that an objective that there isn't sort of a lot of uh, 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 everyone's not totally behind of which what's better if it's minimize or maximize variability and catch, but it's something that everyone seems to care about. So we'll come up, I'm sure, again in our exploration trade-offs down the line. Um, so in the, in the spirit of thinking about the uh, transdisciplinary research, we also um, have developed some uh, questions and had, model, had discussions about model development, uh, specifically with uh, fishermen on the water, as well as the managers and um, the things that they thought were most important. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these questions uh, just for the sake of time, but um, this is uh, an aspect of bringing stakeholders into the sort of scientific process of deciding what's in and what's out of the model and um, using their knowledge uh, as best we can to inform um, the uh, inform the model that we're building. Um, and then lastly, thinking about what management strategies to test, um, ultimately the, um, the managers here are most interested in testing the status quo uh, management uh, system and, and asking whether it's robust to um, variability and the spatially dynamic nature of the Hake stock um, now and, and, and what we think is gonna happen in the future. Um, and potentially also look thinking about changes in survey frequency. So um, that's the sort of process that we've established. I'll tell you a little bit about the model in the last few minutes I have uh, and then I'll go into the sort of conclusions. So um, for this, problem, uh, as I've mentioned, we're building a simulation model uh, to, to play out all these different scenarios. And the simulation model is a spatially explicit model with two boxes. Um, so the fish move between the US and Canada. Um, obviously, we track uh, the catches being removed uh, each year, as well as natural mortality. Um, and then the fish migrate and uh, then and recruitment happens every year to sort of replenish the uh, or reset the stock for the next season. So there's right now we have a model that's got four time steps per year um, and these two model boxes. And um, ultimately what we're working towards is building environmental drivers into the migration uh, and movement piece as well as uh, potentially recruitment. 
So um, Nis Jacobson, the postdoc, who I mentioned, um, has been working really hard at developing this closed loop loop simulation model. Um, so the piece I just showed you in the previous slide sort of defines the operating model and the de data generation process. Um, and then ultimately we run this through an estimation model or stock assessment model to ask what uh, the assessment perceives the biomass being. Um, use that to set the control or set, set the catch level using the harvest control rule and then run it through again. So each one of these loops would represent a single year. Um, we're, uh, NIST has pretty much got this model built and is beginning to condition it. Um, and so we have some uh, initial conditioning results that are showing uh, that we're able to sort of replicate both what the assessment, the currently used assessment, thinks is happening in this population, um, uh, as well as the you know, survey, which is you know, used in the assessment. So um, this is just preliminary to show that we are beginning this process of matching up uh, what, this, what our simulation model uh, is doing with the uh, data and observations that we do have, uh, both in terms of the survey and the um, age of the catch. And um, so once we finish that process, what we'll, what we'll be doing, uh, I guess what, what I've just shown you is the model that we're developing first that's based on age-based movement, but we'll be moving into, uh, as I mentioned, some climate-driven movement um, and, uh, and ultimately probably looking at both age and climate-based movement. Uh, and so we, all of this is to ask, you know, does the harvest control rule perform the same? Or does it perform okay under each of these different um, hypotheses about how the, the fish stock is operating? Um, and so to inform some of this environmental work, I just wanna um, highlight some work that Mike Malik, who's the postdoc at the Northwest Center is doing with Mary Hunsaker and uh, a team, a large team of researchers as part of a state-funded project. So Mike is looking at different hypotheses uh, using empirical data of what drives the, the summer spatial distribution of hake. Uh, and so uh, this early work is exploring hypotheses of uh, temperature, ocean currents, and um, hake Asian size. And so his, he's using GAMS uh, and, and thinking about um, how these relationships might, um, uh, might play out uh, and, and ultimately finding right now that there's some non-stationary temperature effects going on in the sort of most northern and most southern extreme regions of this population. And so this is super interesting and we'll be using it as he finalizes it to uh, develop what the relationships are between the environment and movement in our operating model. So the next steps of this work are really to uh, complete the first step of conditioning of our spatial operating model and share those results back with our um, MSC working group and managers. Um, use that to evaluate the current management strategy and then add these additional um, operating models, different assumptions about how the system works um, with climate driven movement uh, to explore current and future scenarios of climate variability and change in, in the stock. And so I think um, that sort of takes me full circle back to sort of the lessons learned in um, doing this work so far. Um, and so I think uh, a lot of my lessons learned are. Um, maybe intuitive once, once I say them out loud, but they certainly weren't intuitive to me when I started. So I think it's uh, worth, worth saying. <laughs> um, so in any kind of process like this, uh, the, the sort of two-way nature of communication is super critical. And so that, we found that to be the case in both in terms of talking across different um, science disciplinary boundaries as well as uh, between science and stakeholders. Um, and so talking and listening uh, are both really important in incorporating, um, trying to incorporate all of these different kinds of information and knowledge in these complicated problems. Um, I found with the MSE work that um, in particular that being um, adaptable and open to the iterative nature of um, defining objectives and, and um, talking about trade-offs is uh, really challenging, but uh, super important. And so, uh, you know, often uh, as a scientist, I want to sort of like jump to the end, uh, but the process of going through all the step, steps and um, talking through them, communicating them, translating them to language that everybody understands is really important. Um, there's this balance, uh, I think, particularly MSC approaches between management oriented and model oriented work um, and finding the sweet spot in sort of how much our science products are um, sort of uh, focused around these um, cool 
uh, science or cool modeling approaches, for example, versus um, building the tools that are sort of most useful where the management questions are. Um, I think it's, it's going to always be a sort of a struggle to find what exactly is the right spot in there uh, for any case study. Uh, it's also, you know, obviously stakeholders are really diverse. Um, fishing, uh, fishing fleet dynamics are, or fishing uh, fleets can be also really diverse. Um, what people want and, and their perceptions of uh, how fish and fisheries operate are really different. Um, of course, that's true, but uh, I think that these both EDFM and uh, management strategy evaluations, and through this uh, doing a transdisciplinary research process, sort of reveals these differences uh, even more strongly, and I think uh, hopefully allows us to be. Um, uh, more transparent about what those differences are and what they mean for um, people's objectives. Uh, and then lastly, the research teams that we are trying to go about doing work like this really benefit from uh, diverse expertise. And diverse, I mean, in terms of different scientific disciplines being represented in the Hake work, we have oceanographers that are involved with uh, Mike Malik's work and, and you know, ecologists, stock assessment people, uh, but then also the, um, the uh, diverse in terms of the uh, what you consider uh, knowledge and um, learning and who that knowledge and learning is coming from. So bringing those stakeholders into the process and, and, and trying to incorporate their experience as well, as well. So I'll just close by coming back to this idea that EBFM uh, with MSCs uh, using these transdisciplinary approaches is sort of, I think, a pretty powerful tool to help sort of identify uh, and um, make transparent to all of these different domains and sort of the context specificness will uh, obviously come out in any particular application, but hopefully I've given you a flavor for um, how some of these tools can be used uh, to try to balance all of these uh, domains and, um, and uh, trying to tackle some of these difficult problems. So with that, if I have any time left, I would be happy to take some questions. Very much. Thanks, uh, Kristen. Uh, we're back here in Silver Spring and we do have one question online. But before I do that, anyone in the room here? Yes. Can yeah, you just you. say who you are? And... Oh, this is uh, Mo Nelson with uh, NLS right next door. Can, uh, can you hear uh, Kristen? You might need to come up a little okay. bit. Sorry. <laughs> uh, there's a question here, uh, and he's coming up close to the phone. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I'm curious how uh, the MSC development fits in with uh, kind of existing uh, management procedures in the Fishery Management Council, does this feed right into a Fishery Management Plan Amendment uh, procedure? Um, well, certainly it could, um, but I think, you know, in this, in the context of Hake, I can speak to that one because that's, you know, specifically what I'm working on. Um, the, the management strategy evaluation is something the, manage, the management committee asked, has been asking for um, to sort of better elucidate um, the trade-offs between the Canadian and, and U.S. components of the uh, fishery, in particular, um, and so so they haven't they haven't specifically said we're looking to evaluate a new control rule or do something particularly different. More so, they're interested in this process to uh, to better understand the implications of their current management. So in that case, that's what it's, what it's about. Certainly. Um, it, uh, in other places, um, for example, uh, the, uh, what I know of the Atlantic Herring MSE that the um, New England region is, is undertaking, like that, that one is about uh, coming up with a new control rule for Atlantic Herring. And so in that case, it's sort of uh, more linked to a specific decision that, that they're hoping to make in the future. Um, but I think it's very context specific with how, um, how the, the particular MSE is applied. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kristen. There are three um, questions online, and maybe we can try to do that before uh, or in the next few minutes. Uh, it's uh, almost four, but I just I want to start with the top one there. C can um, Kristen see these? Uh, yeah, Kristen, can you see these uh, questions? There are three questions on the screen in the question panel. Mm, I don't see the, any questions. Okay. But if you read them to me, I can answer. <laughs> okay, what, the first one is uh, from Mark Grant. What is F S P S S P R forty ten? Oh, okay. Sorry. That um, so that's just the um, 
the way the harvest control rule is formulated in terms of um, the fishing mortality rate, uh, and it's in for the purposes of Hake, it's it's uh, instead of talking about relative unfished biomass, which is typically how people phrase it, uh, it's, it's in terms of a spawning potential ratio, so SPR is spawning potential ratio. Um, so it's uh, just sort of a, a different way of, of defining the, the scale of, of how much fishing influences the stock dynamics. Um, I'm thinking the next two questions, perhaps maybe Kristen, you can take them offline. We'll, we'll send them to you. Um, sure. And who has asked the questions? They're, they're uh, kind of detailed questions, and I think it's probably going to take a bit more time for you uh, to respond. Okay. So we'll send those to one is from Kelly Andrews, and the other one is uh, Samuel Chavez. And it's a, one about the Haida project, and then also about Eco, EcoPath with EcoSim. So uh, sure. we'll send those questions if you don't mind, and those folks can, uh, you'll get their email so you can respond to them on an email. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Kristen, for taking the time to share this with us. Uh, appreciate all your efforts here, and to, thanks to your team. I know you mentioned Melissa Poe. She was online, too. So uh, thanks to everybody who joined us today. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Chris Harvey, and that is on the second Wednesday of October. That's October 10th. And so um, and if folks are interested to uh, learn more about this, you can come to the NOAA Brown Bag uh, website, uh, where many of these presentations are archived, uh, the uh, slides, as well as the audio. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.